Oh, good evening. Welcome to Western Avenue Baptist Church. This is our first meeting after the end of Awana, um, so we don't have the same um, time constraints as uh, before. Um, Terry has been encouraged to take up more, more fully the hour that he has ahead of him. Let me go ahead and open us up in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this evening, this opportunity that we have to be able to go back into the Gospel of Mark. And Father, I pray that you be with Terry, help him by the Spirit to be clear uh, in communicating what he has studied, what he has learned, uh, that we may more faithfully understand your will and purpose as communicated through this wonderful Gospel. And through our understanding, we pray that your Spirit would help to illuminate our hearts and our minds that we may continue to be transformed into the greater likeness of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray that you receive all the glory. Uh, we pray for anyone else who might be on their way, and we give thanks to you for this time. We pray them in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus. Amen. No, I just didn't have it turned on. The, uh, they ought to make a way to have these permanently installed. You wouldn't have to mess with the wires. <laughs> So I have to find my place here on my tablet. In the meantime, we're still in Mark chapter 14, approaching uh, about three-fourths of the way through. We want to give a little bit of review of what we've been talking about in this chapter before we go on. And an issue has come up. As <clears throat> As I was reviewing, I realized there's a, I don't know as though I want to say controversial issue, but a theological issue that you probably ought to be aware of just in case it comes up. And that's probably going to take most of our time tonight. <clears throat> on the one hand, I hate to spend a lot of time on it because it will take us away from focusing on Mark, but at the same time, you might come across it, <laughs> so it's good to be aware of it. Um, so, Mark chapter 14 starts with the religious leaders wanting to arrest Jesus and kill him. Uh, we see him anointed in Bethany, and then they prepare the Passover for him and he eats the Passover with his disciples and during the dinner he tells them both that he will be betrayed and that they will all leave him which they deny but uh, he says we'll see about that he gets to Gethsemane verse 32 we've talked about his sufferings in Gethsemane we made it all the way through uh, uh, verse, actually up to verse 46. So, <clears throat> his starting with his suffering there in the garden, this, this gets into this theological issue. <clears throat> There's no clicker. You may, you may remember, although I doubt it, back when uh, remote controls came out for televisions, they were, they when they first came out, they were sound activated. So you'd click and the sound of the clicker would activate the television. And thank you. <laughs> 
and uh, this guy said he had a little dog, long nails, and when he'd walk across the floor, the clicks would change the <laughs> channels on the television. <clears throat> we have progressed. Um, so last time we talked about Jesus suffering, three aspects of suffering in the garden and during his trials and on the cross. And this has been, you know, we talked about this, so I just want to go through this quickly just to, as background reminder. So suffering on the, on the cross, or excuse me, in the garden, uh, he's suffered because of the pending judgment and, and physical suffering, the lack of emotional support when his disciples kept going to sleep, his betrayal from, by Judas, who was one of his disciples, and then the abandonment when all of the disciples left him. When he's on trial before the Jews, he suffered false testimony and uh, illegal proceedings, also uh, mockery and beatings, Peter's denial. When he was on trial before Pilate, he suffered injustice because there wasn't any reason for him to be on trial at all, let alone for a capital crime. He hadn't done anything. And then finally, mockery and more beating, but this time by the Roman soldiers rather than the Jews. <clears throat> on the cross, we see his... <clears throat> his refusal to take the anesthetic, which would deaden the pain because he needed to take the full brunt of the judgment. We saw rejection, the mockery of his claims. He claimed to be able to rebuild the temple in three days. He claimed to be the savior of mankind and to be the king of the Jews. And the people walking by were making fun of him for those claims, like here he is on the cross. How can we expect you to believe us <laughs> that you can do all these things or are all these things when you're in the process of dying? If you come down from the cross, then we will believe. But he had a job to do, and he finished, because what he was doing on the cross was for their benefit. And so he finished the job. We have a declaration of purpose when he refers to Psalm 22, a messianic psalm, trying to tell the people this is what's happening now. One more chance for the religious leaders to acknowledge that he is who he says he is. He's fulfilling prophecy. But they didn't do it. And then finally, the declaration of completion when he says it is finished and dies. Death is the last suffering he experienced on the on the cross. So we're going to go into these in detail, each section, but before we do that, I want to deal with this theological issue. Um, I have a handout there um, with this chart. So everything that's going to be on the screen is going to be on a handout, well, almost everything. <clears throat> So it starts, as usual, with a little introductory paragraph or two. It says, some groups believe that the suffering of Jesus that has relevance to our spiritual condition was accomplished in the garden and that his suffering on the cross was relatively unimportant. This is the theological issue. Okay, some people say, well, what he suffered in the garden is what paid for our sins. Well, that's a problem. So it goes on there. However, Scripture clearly shows that it was Christ's suffering on the cross that was expiatory. We'll define these terms as we go along. Or the means of removing guilt. So expiation basically means taking away the guilt. <clears throat> so of Jesus' three experiences of suffering in the Gospels, Jesus' suffering in the garden was personal the result of his contemplation of all that was about to happen to him. And Luke again tells us he was in such anguish that he sweat drops of blood. We talked about that last week. 
It goes on, his suffering during his trials was religious, persecution by those who considered him an enemy of God. Again, the religious leaders were out to get him. And his suffering on the cross was judicial. He, the substitute, satisfying God's holy requirements for sin so that those who trust in the substitute would not have to pay the penalty. Romans 3 talks about that. We're going to look at all these verses in more detail as we go along. So the focus of both the Old and New Testament in reference to God's redemptive plan emphasizes that only an adequate substitutionary death on behalf of people can accomplish mankind's redemption from sin and judgment and his reconciliation to God. And the following chart summarizes these points. So the chart basically takes what I just put in those three paragraphs into a graphic form. Okay, so it's kind of repetitious. That's okay. Repetition never hurt anybody unless he was being spanked. So on the left we have the experiences, the different aspects of suffering in the garden and during trials and on the cross, and then the nature of that suffering, personal, religious, and judicial. We want to focus mainly on the biblical focus here, and we will get into these verses in a minute. I need to get my place here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> First scripture says that there's a need for the shedding of blood or the death of the sacrifice. Makes it clear, Exodus chapter 12, which is all about the the killing of the Passover lamb and Leviticus 17 talks about the life being in the blood and God gave it to them for uh, sacrifices to make propitiation, satisfaction for their sins. Hebrews 9, 15 to 16, and 22. Again, we'll talk about these in detail in a minute. <clears throat> Secondly, the focus of the Bible is it says that Jesus fulfilled all those Old Testament or Old Covenant sacrificial requirements, the death of the sacrifice. In Matthew 26, the Last Supper, he said, this is my body, this is my blood, which is given for you, the new covenant in my blood. Again, Hebrews chapter 9, and then John 129, John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And by the way, these are just a few of these verses. There are many more that could be cited. And then finally, the priority of the cross in New Testament teaching. <clears throat> All of these verses emphasize the centrality of the cross. In the Corinthian verses there, Paul says, You know, I, when I came to you, all I preached to you was Jesus crucified. That's all I ever wanted to know among you. Okay. Uh, And same with Galatians. We'll we'll look at them. So why would the New Testament focus so much on the cross if it wasn't the suffering on the cross that, that did the job? And that seems to be the wrong focus. Nobody in the New Testament focuses on the suffering in the garden. It's all about the suffering on the cross. So we have kind of a, um, okay, well, excuse me, before we get to the conclusion, which is on the handout, it's not, the next slide isn't the conclusion, okay? I want to go through these verses. So I expanded that right-hand section of the chart we just looked at and copied and pasted, which you probably can't read from there, Uh, just to give you an idea of what these things say. So some of these verses um, have three or four or five verses, and I kind of picked the central statement, but you can go back and and read and uh, fill in the gaps. So the need for the shedding of blood, Exodus 12, 1 to 13. It says there, then, while the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel excuse me, then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it, that is the lamb, at twilight. 
talked about this before. This is what the disciples had to do in preparing for the celebration of Passover. So the death of the lamb is essential. Leviticus 17.11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. So the sacrifice has to die. How are you going to get the blood if you don't kill the sacrifice? They kind of go together. And then Hebrews 9, uh, 15 and 16 and 22 says, For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. And then verse 22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. So it's essential that the sacrifice die and that the blood be shed. Those two go together. And... Then Jesus fulfilling this, again, we see Matthew 26, the Last Supper. He says, this is my body, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness and atonement go together. And then Hebrews 9 says, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Every time one of those Old Testament saints sinned, he had to offer a sacrifice in order to receive forgiveness for that sin. That forgiveness was permanent. God keeps his word. You, know, you sin and you sacrifice, I'll forgive that sin. But every time they sinned, they had to sacrifice again. But when Jesus shed his blood and took his blood into the Holy of Holies in heaven, in the presence of God, the atonement, the forgiveness that he accomplished was eternal, covers all sin. So you don't have to sacrifice any more sin by sin. It's all been covered in Christ's sacrifice. We'll touch on that again in a little bit. And John one twenty nine again, John the Baptist identifies him as the Lamb of God, that sacrifice that takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus fulfilled those requirements of the death of the sacrifice and the shedding of the blood. And then the priority of the New Testament. Um, I'm not seeing all of this. Well, I don't have a paper copy with me. I didn't print it out, but no, that. <laughs> I have that. <laughs> the problem is, you know, I put this PowerPoint together using Microsoft Word, and I put it on my tablet, which is Google. And so there are compatibility issues. <laughs> Formatting just goes out the window. So I don't see it all. <laughs> and I usually rely on a paper copy, but I didn't print it out. Anyway, Hebrews chapter 10 uh, 4 to 10 says, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Where did he offer his body? On the cross. 1 Corinthians 1, 23, we preach Christ crucified. In chapter 2, verse 2, he says, I knew nothing uh, with you except Christ crucified. And Galatians chapter 3 the Galatians were drifting away from what he had taught them, and he's kind of chiding them for that. And he says, how can you abandon the teaching so soon, the, the teaching that Christ had been crucified for you? And then Romans 6, 1 to 6, it says, all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death, so that we can be raised with him in newness of life. But the identification is in his death, and his death was on the cross. So the New Testament teaching, as far as the suffering of Jesus goes, clearly shows that the suffering that paid the penalty for our sin happened on the cross, not in the garden. I don't know where anybody gets the idea <laughs> that it happened in the garden. Certainly, well... Let's finish with the summary that's on your chart there. Uh, it says, clearly Jesus' suffering in the garden involved the shedding of blood, but not to the point of death. 
Death was necessary for the forgiveness of sin, but he didn't die in the garden. The sacrificial death that provided atonement for us occurred on the cross. So while we don't want to minimize or discount Jesus' agony in the garden, that suffering was not for our benefit. This is affirmed throughout the New Testament by the emphasis on Christ's work on the cross and how it should impact our lives. So that's the theological issue. Uh, which aspect of his suffering paid the penalty? And it wasn't the garden. It had to be the cross. Does that make sense? Distort is the word. <laughs> well, if you want some insight into that, um, you might want to read a book. It's called Scripture Twisting. And the subtitle is 20 Ways That the Cults Twist Scripture. Scripture Twisting by uh, Sire, James Sire, S-I-R-E. Uh, it's not a big book, but it, he really just zeroes in on these things. Okay? Yeah, so a lot of it is the fact that they just don't want to take it for what it says. That you know they're not comfortable with that. They think it should say something different, and so they manipulate it so it it fits what what they want to believe. Yeah, I notice on the <clears throat> handout you describe penal substitutionary atonement. That's the idea that Jesus Christ went to the cross. He went as our substitute to bear the penalty that we deserve to bear for our sins. And there's a lot of people that really hate that concept. Um, and, and these are often people that do not want to acknowledge that all men are sinners, um, that men, men are inherently good, um, or that our sins somehow need cleansing or payment. So by shifting the narrative of suffering to the garden, it's no longer about the payment that had to be made, but now it's an example that you can follow where just as Jesus suffered, he identifies with your suffering. Um, not saying that's what everyone believes that denies uh, the penal substitutionary atonement, but that's one common narrative. What we often find is that when Scripture gets twisted against what the Bible clearly states, um, typically there is an agenda behind that twisting. They have already started with their theology, and they're trying to twist the Scriptures to support their theology rather than reading the Scriptures for what it is and developing their theology from that. Right. Exactly. I think part of the misunderstanding, not to belabor the point, <laughs> is that people don't understand depravity. When you use the word depravity, people think, oh, people who are depraved are the worst. You know, they're the they're the scum of the earth, you know. You can't get anywhere. Those people are really depraved. That's not depravity. <laughs> depravity has to do with our condition before God. Everyone is equally depraved, meaning we're all separated from God, born separated from God and destined for judgment. That's depravity, Romans chapter 3. The word depravity is never used in the Bible, but Romans 3 really describes it, especially verses 9 to 18. There's no one who is good, you know, no one does any, you know, no one who's righteous and all that. That's depravity. We're all equally depraved. Now, people express that depravity to one degree or another, but the fact of depravity applies to everyone. And people start comparing, well, I'm not as bad as that person, so they think they must be pretty good. God's not going to have any problem with me because I'm not as bad as that guy. That's not depravity. Okay? You're in trouble with God, even if you're a nice guy. Okay? Just because that's the way you were born. Yeah, Ephesians 2, 1 to 3 also. Um, without an understanding of depravity, I don't believe that we can appreciate what the Bible means when it talks about the grace, mercy, and love of God. Exactly. So people, you hear people say, you know, everybody's basically good. Well, <laughs> yeah. I, I, you look around at our society, you know, and you think, really? <laughs> what is it about people that you think is basically good? 
But that's, I think that's part of the motivation for wanting to avoid that idea of the need of a substitute. You know, because I'm not that bad. Okay, so to finish up this thought of, of uh, the substitution, we dealt with the theological issue of, of which suffering of Jesus did the job, took away the sin. But I can hear people saying, well, then how does that work out? <laughs> how does that sacrifice do the job from a you know, practical, everyday point of view? So just to fill in the gaps there, I put together this uh, little further theological study called Exploring Expiation. We already talked about expiation being the removal of guilt. So how does that happen? Well, in the first place, start with the, with the goal here. God's ultimate goal for mankind is reconciliation. Ephesians 2, which you just mentioned, the first six verses, uh, we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but God made us alive with him, etc. Colossians 2 talks about God reconciling us to himself through Christ's blood. That's, again, the cross. The substitutionary death made it possible for God to reconcile. To reconcile means to become on the same side. Enemies becoming friends. The stumbling block, and we're back to Ephesians 2 here. The law, sin specifically, is what separates us from God. So God removed the sin problem because of Christ's death, and therefore there's no more blockage between us and God. We are reconciled, made one with God. The barrier has been taken away. And then 2 Corinthians 5.19, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Okay, so that's God's ultimate goal, is to reconcile people to himself to make his enemies his friends, to take away the thing that separates us from God. The prerequisite <clears throat> for reconciliation is atonement, which is forgiveness of sins. It's the sin that keeps us from God. So you atone for the sin, get rid of the guilt of the sin, and there's no more blockage. So how do you get atonement? <laughs> <laughs> to lead to reconciliation. Well, there are three, I want to say, steps. Technically, <clears throat> these three things happen simultaneously, but logically you can see a sequence. Okay. Uh, I call them here three parts, three sequential parts to atonement. There is redemption, which is the payment of a price. We've already seen in, in Hebrews chapter 9, uh, Jesus paid the price, took his own blood into the Holy of Holies in heaven. And uh, <clears throat> remove that sin burden or that sin uh, blockage. Chapter 10, verses 5 through 10, uh, Jesus says there, you've prepared a body for me. And the purpose of him taking on a body was so that he could die to perform that sacrifice. And that leads to redemption. So he paid the price. Secondly is propitiation. Nice British term. It means satisfaction. This is the satisfaction of God's holy requirements. Hebrews 2.17 says he had to be made like us so that he could be an adequate substitute, an adequate representative, an adequate high priest. He knows what it's like to be human so he can represent us sympathetically. And it says there to provide propitiation for our sins. Romans 3.25 uh, talks about Christ's death providing propitiation. We'll get into these verses in Romans more in detail in a minute. 
1 John 2.2, 2, that Jesus was the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the world. And then finally, there's expiation, which is the removal of guilt. Here again, we're back to Romans 3. And Romans 8 and verse 1 says, There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. That's often misunderstood, so we'll go into a little bit of hermeneutics with that verse in a minute. <clears throat> I, when I was studying Romans in cemetery, in cemetery right, seminary, um, I came across Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, and it impressed me, so I drew the, the letters for the words, there is therefore now no condemnation. I drew them freehand, like, kind of like a stencil on hard cardboard, well, cereal box cardboard, and cut it out and put red construction paper behind it so the red showed through the holes in the letters. And I hung it from the ceiling above my desk. And nobody got it. There is therefore now no condemnation. There was, but there isn't any more. So judicially, what do you call that? It's a suspended sentence. But nobody got it. <laughs> so it was suspended. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> the way my brain works. Anyway, Gary will be here all week, folks. <laughs> so the following chart then summarizes this process. I don't have a handout for this. Oh, I do have it, but I didn't print it out. I think it'll be clear enough on the screen. <clears throat> <clears throat> so I'm taking the same information I just gave and putting it into kind of a graphic form, okay? So again, we're exploring expiation, and we start with the goal, which is reconciliation, enemies becoming friends. We've already looked at uh, Romans uh, chapter 5, I think that says 5. And verse 9, let's say 5. Didn't put it up there, sorry. There it is, yeah, 5, 9. Um, and Colossians 1, 21, 22. We already looked at those verses. So that's the goal. So how do we get there? Well, start in the lower left. You start with redemption. Okay. Redemption, again, is uh, securing freedom by paying a price. God, or Christ was the substitute. He paid the price. It starts there. Uh, Hebrews 9, you'll notice that Hebrews shows up a lot here. Let me, let me back out of this study for a second to give a commercial. You know, the, the books in our English Bible <clears throat> are not arranged in chronological order, either the Old Testament or the New Testament. Now, the Hebrew Bible, in Hebrew, is arranged chronologically. It's different from our, if you pick up a Hebrew Bible and look at the order of the books, it's different from our Old Testament. So the books are not in chronological order. They're not in any particular order. <laughs> now, with the Old Testament, you might say, well, somebody tried to group the law and the prophets and the writings, which are the three main divisions. Maybe. But in the New Testament, there's no uh, particular order. So I would, I would suggest a rearrangement. One, one rearrangement of the order of the books in the New Testament. 
We studied the book of Hebrews a couple of years ago. The book of Hebrews is written by a Jew to Jews because some of the Jews in this congregation were wanting to go back to the Old Covenant because they were being persecuted. They had forsaken the Old Covenant, accepted the New Covenant with Jesus as the Messiah, and their Old Covenant friends were giving them a hard time. And so they were thinking, I don't need this hassle, so I'm just going to go back. And the writer says, you can't do that because the Old Covenant doesn't work anymore. The New Covenant has replaced it. And the whole book of Hebrews explains that transition from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. So I would suggest that Bible publishers put the book of Hebrews, at least chapters 9 and 10 in the book of Hebrews, because those are really pivotal, but preferably the whole book. Put the book of Hebrews between Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2. Everything from Genesis through Acts chapter 1 is Old Covenant. That's the law of Moses. It was still in effect. Acts chapter 2, with the coming of the Holy Spirit, the new covenant is introduced. Now, the new covenant technically was put in place when Jesus died and rose again from the dead, but it didn't take effect until the Spirit came in Acts chapter 2. So, in your Bible reading, you might want to try this, when you get to the end of chapter 1, or Acts chapter 1, immediately go to Hebrews and read through the book of Hebrews. And then go to Acts chapter 2, and it will give you a framework for understanding the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. So this is why Hebrew shows up here in, the, in this study of reconciliation and redemption and all of that. Because the writer explains how Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection fulfilled all of those requirements of the Old Covenant, and therefore the Old Covenant doesn't work anymore. We have to deal with the New Covenant now. Okay. So, end of commercial. Uh, Hebrews 9, 12, 10, 5, 10, we've looked at those already. Let's go to, to Romans chapter 3 because we need to be reading these, these uh, verses as we go through this section <clears throat> to see how they apply to these different theological terms and uh, steps in the redemption process. And by the way, a little caveat here. The terms that we're using here to show how all of this fits together are often used as synonyms for each other. So it's difficult to sort these things out and separate, and this is here, and this is here, and this is here, because they're all used at the same time for the same thing. So, as I mentioned a couple minutes ago, from a practical point of view, all of this happens instantaneously at salvation. Now, you couldn't, in your salvation experience, sit down and say, okay, uh, redemption is happening now, and oops, now we've got propitiation. <laughs> oops, now. <laughs> it doesn't happen that way. It all happens at once. But logically, as you look at what each of these things mean, you can see a sequence. Okay, so that's just a little caveat so you, your confusion won't be any deeper than it needs to be. <laughs> Not that it needs to be deep. So, uh, redemption, paying the price. Romans 3.24. Everybody knows 3.23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the all there, in the context of the first five chapters of Romans, four chapters, excuse me, means that Jews are just as guilty as Gentiles when it, when it comes to their relationship with God. All have sinned, including the Jews. The Jews thought they had it made because they had that covenant. And Paul tells them here in this section, if you don't obey the covenant, it doesn't do you any good. <laughs> and if the Gentiles obey the principles of the covenant, even though they don't have the covenant, they're in better standing with God than you are. 
because they're doing what he wants us to do and you're not. So it's kind of like putting the Jews in their place. So all have sinned, you Jews as well as the Gentiles. So verse 24, because all have failed to live up to God's standards, that's 23, 24 says, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. His death on the cross paid the price, paid the penalty, that's redemption. And it's the redemption, the price that he paid, that brings us to justification. Justification is another one of those theological terms, and we'll get to that one in a minute. It's nowhere on this chart. It's kind of hiding, but it's there. Okay. So, once redemption has been accomplished, that's going to lead to propitiation. Propitiation is the satisfaction of God's holy standards. And we see that in Hebrews 2.17, which we referred to a minute ago. He was made like us so he could be an adequate high priest and provide propitiation, satisfaction. Romans 3.25, notice what it says there. Whom, referring to Christ, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. So Christ's death on the cross paid the penalty, and because the penalty was paid, it satisfied God's demands. So you can see the sequence there. The price is paid, therefore God is satisfied. Since God is satisfied, that leads to expiation which is the removal of guilt. Hebrews 10, 11 to 18, again says that because Christ paid that ultimate sacrifice once for all, there is no more need to sacrifice for sin. It's all been forgiven. The guilt is gone. So Romans 3, 25 and 26, well, the last part of 25, um, well, we can, well, might as well read it. Because in the, in, well, 25, he displayed him publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. That is, Christ's sacrifice covered all of those sins. So God doesn't need to deal with them, with us personally, because they're already covered. 26, for the demonstration, he dem provided Christ as a demonstration of his righteousness. 26, for a demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Paul is answering a potential uh, problem here. <clears throat> He just said that those sins were forgiven. They've been covered. He, so Paul says, I can just hear somebody say, well, wait a minute. How can God be a just God if he doesn't punish the guilty? Well, he explains in verse 26. The substitute took the price or took the punishment. He paid the price. And the person who identifies with the substitute then is considered to have paid the price. So he doesn't have to pay it anymore. So God is off the hook in a sense. He can forgive the guilty because technically they're not guilty anymore because they identify with the substitute. He accepted the sacrifice of the substitute on behalf of the person who has faith, which he mentions here in these verses. Therefore, when he sees that person who trusts in the substitute, he doesn't see sin anymore. It's been removed. So God is not compromising his justice because the price has been paid. So he can be just and the justifier of the one who is guilty or the one who has sinned because that sin has been taken away. 
excuse me. Now, I said the justification fits in here. What you have to do, and it's difficult to do in these, this situation, you have to take that word expiation and kind of grab it by the end and peel it back. And on the other side of the word expiation, you have the word justification. Justification happens because the guilt has been removed. Justification means you have a clean record with God. But the only way you can have a clean record with God is if you're no longer guilty. So expiation takes away the guilt, which means automatically you're justified. You have a clean record before God. Okay. So as I said, these terms are often used as synonyms. But if you look at them logically, there is a particular relationship here. So, any questions about that much? All right. So all of these things then go together, the redemption, the propitiation, expiation, they go together as atonement. All of these things go together to form atonement. And atonement is the forgiveness of sin. So we get forgiveness of sin through all of these steps. Okay. And it's atonement then that leads us to reconciliation. Because the price has been paid, we are no longer guilty. We are justified and therefore God has nothing against us anymore and we can be reconciled. Enemies becoming friends. Okay. And that's kind of a long way around. <laughs> but when we go back to which form of suffering paid the price, obviously it was suffering on the cross because that was substitutionary death of the sacrifice and the shedding of blood, which was the requirement. But how does the death of the sacrifice and the shedding of blood lead to that reconciliation? Well, this is how. Okay. Now you're going to have nightmares. <laughs> you're going to see all these words floating around. <laughs> so any questions about that? I want to ask, does that make sense? But maybe it's too early. <laughs> some of these things, at least I know for me, it takes some time for things to settle. And eventually, you know, things click and they think, oh, okay, now I get it. Yeah, yeah the, the, the book of Romans, I would say one of the major themes in that book that you see mentioned over and over again is the righteousness of God, especially in those first few chapters. And the point that Paul makes and really climaxes with in chapter 3 is the depravity of man, that no one is righteous. And no one will be declared righteous. And so justification is that declaration of righteousness. So Romans really just helps us to understand, especially when you get into chapter 3, helps us to understand how justification works. And it's only by faith. It is not by works. It's not by anything that we bring to the table. Now, I think it's worth mentioning that you will also find the word justification in the book of James. And when you study it in the book of James, what you'll realize is that James is not using justification in the same way that Paul is using justification. Paul is using it to talk about God's declaration of your righteousness, and, and that can't happen unless your sins have been wiped away and forgiven. James talks about it in the sense of this is how your faith reveals itself. This is how your faith shows itself. So that's why he says faith without works is dead. And so he goes on to say that your works, your, your, your faith is justified by your works, meaning that your faith will prove itself through the, the works that come out of it. So just realize that uh, Paul and James, when they use those words, they're not using them in the exact same way. Right. Yeah, Romans is basically a theological treatise. Um, in seminary, I got studying Romans in the class. I got to looking at it as I'm reading through the book, and I realize that Romans covers every single aspect of systematic theology. He covers it all, chapter by chapter. Now, there are some overlaps and repetitions, but 
if you want a, a, a biblical approach to systematic theology, read Romans. It covers it all. It's amazing. Okay, so that takes care of our theological issue. <laughs> because some, you may come across someone who says, well, all the suffering that made the difference was in the garden. No, it doesn't work that way. Okay. So back to Mark. And this we covered last week, so we'll go over this again just as review to get our bearings, and then we'll pick up next week. <laughs> So this week has been primarily a review with a little side, side journey there. So we have his suffering in the garden, the pending judgment and the physical suffering and lack of emotional support from his disciples. We have his betrayal and arrest. In the betrayal, we saw the, the mob from the Jews. It doesn't say how many were there, but it says a large crowd with, with torches and, and swords and all of that stuff from the Jews. There was also, John tells us, a cohort of Roman soldiers, which usually was 600. So more than 600 people here. We have the identification when Judas, he, it says there, he told the, this mob and the soldiers, the one that I kiss will be the one. Now, a kiss is a sign of greeting, but he used it as a sign of betrayal, just the opposite, which is in itself a heartbreak, I'm sure. So it says there, he went up to Jesus and kissed him, but the word kiss, as we saw last time, is the intense form of the word. It means to kiss fervently or repeatedly. It's the word used uh, when it talks about Mary pouring the perfume on Jesus' feet and kissing his feet. It's just over and over and over. So he didn't want any mistakes. When he said, the one I kiss is the one, he wanted to be sure they understood. Now remember, this is midnight. It's dark. Now they did have torches, so there's probably light, but he wanted to be sure they got the right guy. Okay. And then we see Jesus' submission to this. In Matthew 26, 50, he told Judas, friend, do what you have come for. The word friend means friend or companion. As he said back in verse 20, you know, it's one of the 12, the one who eats with me at supper. He's a friend, a companion. But it shows his submission to this whole process. This brings up an, another uh, interesting point we saw his suffering there in the garden when he goes three times to pray that he wouldn't have to go through this and he's in agony about it but now all of a sudden he's calm no more sweat drops of blood no more distress why because he already settled the issue when he said, I don't really want to go through this, but if this is the way it has to be, then fine. So the issue has been resolved. As long as there was a chance that it could be avoided, he prayed for that. But he came to realize there's no way to avoid this. We have a phrase that we use in situations like this. And you may not have used the phrase, but you certainly have felt what's behind the phrase. If you have a job to do, and it's complicated, it's dirty, it's time-consuming, but you have to do it. You don't want to do it, but you have to do it. You finally give in. You just say, the phrase is, there's nothing for it. You know, it's got to be done. You've got to do it. So there's nothing for it. Just get busy and do it. That's the attitude here. The issue has been resolved. It's not going to be fun, but it's got to be done, so let's get on with it. So he's no more, no, there's no more suffering here, anguish because of this, because it's been resolved. So he submits to it. 
In verse 46, this is where we left off last time, we see the arrest itself, and it's very short. It says, and they laid hands on him and seized him. Um, can you imagine the trip back to Jerusalem? This is in the Garden of Gethsemane. Half a mile maybe back to the city. More than 600 people. <laughs> with torches ushering this one guy back into t somebody had to see that or hear that in fact when they left town to go over there you think somebody must have seen them because there's 600 guys with torches just the sound of the marching should have been audible but remember the context this is the middle of the night People have just celebrated the Passover meal. They're at home. They're not in the temple. They're not anywhere else. They're at home. They may have gone to bed by now. Yeah, so maybe they could get by you know, without anybody hearing them or seeing them. It just seems odd. <clears throat> A couple more minutes. Um... So then we have some resistance, verse 47. But a certain one, <clears throat> Matthew tells it, it was Peter. A certain one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. Commentators have said he's probably aiming for his neck. And the guy had good reflexes and ducked. So all he got was the ear. But he's to defend you know, what did he say before when Jesus said, all of you are going to betray me, are going to abandon me? He said, no, not me. Well, he's trying to fulfill that. He's defending. And we don't have it here, but in Matthew 26, Matthew's account of this, Jesus tells Peter, no, don't do that. You know, that this, has, this is fulfillment of prophecy. If we resist this, then how are we going to fulfill prophecy plus he said don't you think that I could pray to God the father and he would send 12 legions of angels to protect me a legion consisted of 6,000 soldiers 12 times 6,000 that's 72,000 angels would it really take that many I mean, this is overkill. This is, this is exaggeration to make a point. I mean, did he, well, go back to, not really, but in your minds, go back to Genesis chapter 11, Sodom and Gomorrah. Two angels going to stay in Lot's house. And the men of the city want Lot to send them out so they can abuse them. And uh, Lot's trying to bargain with the, people and they're not listening and so the angels realize this isn't going anywhere so they pull Lot back into the house and just blind all of those men he didn't need 72,000 one would have done <laughs> and did he need even one in John's account he asked Jesus asked the people who are you after and they said Jesus of Nazareth and he said I am. And what happened? They all fell backwards. He was expressing his deity. There's power, folks. <laughs> he didn't need anybody to come to his aid. But he was on a mission. He's already resolved. You know, this has to happen. So he's not resisting. So he basically tells Peter, God could have intervened. But he didn't. He chose not to. Jesus chose not to ask for that. He's already resolved the issue in his mind. Verses 35 and 36 here in, in 14. This again is where he's praying that if it's possible, this be removed. God could have removed it. We talked about that before. The implication is that it was possible. But at the same time, he was willing to submit to whatever the Father wanted. 
So God chose not to intervene, and therefore he's going through with the program. So it's, again, another example of submission. Another passage, I think it's in Matthew, he talks about this being prophecy. If we resist, you know, how is prophecy going to be fulfilled? That may be coming up, we'll see. I may be jumping the gun, the gun here. Well, not quite. So we're out of time. Um, so next time we'll pick up here, dealing with the betrayal and the arrest again, because we're not finished with it. We're through verse uh, uh, 47. So we'll pick up with verse 48 and finish this scene in the garden. Any comments, observations about any of that? Okay, let's close in prayer. Again, Father, we thank you that you have enabled us to be on your side. You have cleansed us from that sin that separated us from you. We pray that you will enable us to live in the realization of that and the power of that position so that we can defeat the adversaries and be the people we need to be. In Jesus' name.